Good morning, beloved. What a passage, right? If I had the if I had the opportunity and I could pick one passage that I could preach in a place that would be heard by every American, this would be the passage I would pick. Our country needs this chapter. They need this book. I'm not a uh, political preacher, and I'm not going to get into politics. But one thing is very clear. Our country is in desperate need of salvation, of repentance. What does America need? What does our community need? What do we need? We live amongst the people who are very angry at each other. We have millions of babies that are being murdered every year. We have a pornographic culture obsessed with immorality continuously. We have an identity crisis going on where people are denying their God-given gender. And governing agencies are teaching kindergarten children gender-confusing thoughts. We have people who are so wicked that they will run a car into a group of people who disagree with their racist thoughts. We have people who are so wicked that they will kill, murder, steal. There were over 15,000 murders last year in our country. 90,000 rapes. $14 billion were stolen of property. 1.2 million violent crimes last year. There is one divorce approximately every 36 seconds. There are over 1 million cases of child abuse in America every year. We have a country that calls evil good and good evil. We are a community that participates in a wicked country. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. What do we need? We need repentance. We need repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. We need a revelation of God Almighty. It's almost weekly that these words come to my mind. Romans 1, 24. Therefore God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural And in the same way, also the men abandoned their natural function of the women, of the woman, and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper being filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That is America. What do we need? We need to know 
We need what Nineveh found. Repentance and faith in God. Where does it start? Where does it start? It starts right in this room. It really starts in your chair. It starts when the ambassadors of God repent. When we are on our face, humbly seeking God. It's when everybody in the room bows their heart to God and says, God, I am the chief of sinners. Beloved, this is what we need. This is what we need. I want to warn you of something. Ultimately, what we do does not change hearts. Yes, what we do can soften the blow of God's message. But still, the message is what saves, not our kind acts. It is who God is that saves And the message is ultimately foolishness and offensive to those who are perishing. It is the gospel that changes hearts. It's the proclamation of who God is as revealed in the scripture that changes hearts. We definitely see this in our passage today. Jonah didn't have a great love for the people he was talking to. We'll see that especially in chapter 4. The Ninevites were not his favorite people group. But the grace of God working through the Word of God brought revival. It's the Word of God. It's the gospel that saves and transforms lives. We know this. Romans 10, 13. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will... They call on Him in whom they have not believed. How will they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? The scriptures is what people need to hear. We need to proclaim Christ and Christ crucified and Christ exalted. We need to tell our neighbors. We need to share it. We need to go anywhere we can and talk to everybody we can about Jesus Christ. He is our hope. 1 Peter 1.23 For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. We need the word of God. We need to proclaim the word of God. We need to share the word of God. Colossians 4.2 Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, so that they may speak forth the mysteries of Christ, the gospel, for which I have been also imprisoned, that I might make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Finally, Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also, after what? Listening to what? The message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. What's the beginning for us? It was when we heard what? The gospel. When we heard who God is. And what that means for us, that we are what? We stand condemned. And then we heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And that God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for sinners like me and you. That's what transformed us. Beloved Mormons can be nice neighbors, but their message will lead to eternal damnation. Did you hear me? 
They offer no way out of sin and judgment. You can have the most kind atheist who has ever lived living next door to you, but the wor their words will never save. They offer no way out of sin and judgment. They offer how maybe we can clean up a culture and make it look good on the outside, but ultimately that falls apart, doesn't it? As soon as somebody steps on your toes, you get angry and you do what? You revert back to who you were previously. The kindest acts of service by Mother Teresa never saved anybody. It appears she never spoke the true gospel and therefore many were led to hell by her. That is shocking. She would be considered one of the nicer ladies the world has ever seen. But because her message didn't match the gospel, it meant absolutely nothing. In fact, it meant many went to hell. Beloved, it is the grace of God working in the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves. No amount of good deeds done for a person has ever changed a person's heart. It might make them appreciate you if you're a kind neighbor, but it won't save them. When we do acts of a kind act for people, it makes them maybe like us. We might succeed in becoming popular or people will say, man, that's a really nice person. But that and all the money of the world doesn't save a single soul. <laughs> Do you hear me? It's the gospel. It's the proclamation of who God is. This is what our culture and our world need. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be kind to people. Obviously, the gospel compels us to love like we were loved, right? But listen closely. The main goal for every one of us should be to proclaim the gospel to our neighbors and relatives. It is the message of Jesus that saves, not how kind we are to people. Today we'll see the power of the word of God working in people. Jonah wasn't a, a great prophet. As we will see, he was just a man, right? But the power of the word of God working in people brought about repentance. That's what we need. Jonah's prayer and reflections from the stomach of the fish were found in chapter 2. We saw that. He got it, didn't he? He got the power of God. He got an understanding that God was holy and just, didn't he? He was so aware of it that he knew that as the ship was going down because of a storm that was brought on by God, he says, what? Throw me overboard. Because God is bringing judgment on these people and me for my disobedience. And as he was sinking to the bottom, what happened? He woke up and remembered, what? I'm getting what I deserve. I'm getting judged. I've been disobedient to God, but God may give grace. He may give grace. So I called out. I remembered is what Jonah said. And I called upon the Lord, and he what? Rescued me. The response to, of God to Jonah's prayer of repentance was that he took him up in the fish. And for three days he was there in the fish recording and reflecting on his repentance at the bottom of the ocean. And then God spit him up on shore. Today we will see the grace of God comes to a rebellious people from a repentant prophet. Do you hear me? The grace of God comes to a rebellious people through a repentant prophet. The passage breaks down into three sections. First, the prophet reveals, the city repents, the Lord relents. Let's look. First, 
the prophet reveals. Look in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. What do we see here? Well, we see the prophet, the repentant prophet, is now restored and ready to obey and reveal the word of God. Why did Jonah reveal what God told him to proclaim? Short answer, the grace of God. The unmerited of God, a favor of God. Think about this for a second. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. <laughs> what is that? That's called grace, beloved. <laughs> Did God need Jonah? <laughs> no, he could have picked a different prophet. He had, quote unquote, disqualified himself, hadn't he? He wouldn't have been the one that most of us in the room would have picked, right? But he was perfect for the job. Why was he perfect for the job? Because he was a repentant prophet. He was a prophet that understood that God was holy and that God was just and that God would judge and that but God would also what? Redeem and rescue. He understood the grace of God. Listen, oh, this is some good news. Listen, beloved, listen closely. We often think that our disobedience will cause God to not use us anymore, right? What is that? That's a form of work salvation. <laughs> Do you hear me? Do you blow it? How many of you blew it this week? Yeah. How many of you would be tempted? Well, I'm not going to talk for... I'm not going to talk the word of God. I'm not going to speak the word of God with somebody because after all, I blew it this week, right? Did you repent? If you did, you're the perfect person for the job. That's how God works. As if God is now going to hold our sins over our head and not use us anymore. Do you understand God doesn't need us, but by His grace, He decides to use us. Isn't that good news? Sinners like us. You just don't know how many times your pastor is. I'm sitting there, and Mark's praying. I'm praying. I'm thinking, God, just, I know I'm not worthy, and I'm not any good, and I can't do this without you. God, please help me. I can't believe I'm up here talking to you. Who's the greatest sinner in the room? That's me. That's me. The glory of God that I have seen, and yet I don't always obey my Father. God is a gracious God, though, and he uses even wicked sinners like me. Again, look at God's gracious recommissioning of Jonah in verse 2. It states, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. Get up, Jonah, go and speak. But, there is a little but there. Limit what you say to only what I said tell you to say. Why? Well, because, beloved, it really doesn't matter what I think. And it really doesn't matter what I think of these, this people group and how wicked they are. I might think, Jonah might have thought, I think they deserve what? Judgment. But God says, say what I say only. Now that includes a call to evaluate and know that you're facing the judgment of God. But limit it to only what God wants you to say. The prophet did not make up what he wanted to say. I heard a, a Q&A with 
uh, MacArthur just recently when a person asked him, what authority does the pastor have in a church? And M MacArthur made a statement that was a little shocking. And he said, absolutely none. I have no authority. And his point was this. The ultimate authority is found in what? The word of God. It's what God says. It's not in me. It's not in me. It's what this says. And if it says it, guess what? Take it up with the author. He's God, not us. Right? Beloved, speak only what God would want you to speak and say only what God's word says. Don't speak for God in the way that you would think that somehow you can add to what God needs. There's plenty in this book. Do you understand that? Just plenty. It'll keep us going for a lifetime, won't it? Authority is found in proclaiming God's word, not our opinions. We as ministers of the gospel are not called to share our personal desires or our personal commands or our, or our feelings. We are called to proclaim the truth. And that's God's word. By the way, this is why the word has the impact it does. Why does the word of God have such a powerful impact on Nineveh? Well, because it doesn't have any of man in it. <laughs> when God speaks, what happens? He changes the world. He can change a city. He can change a wicked people through the proclamation of his word. Oh, beloved, get this. Understand. It's not about hobby horses. It's about the word of God. If it's true, we must submit to it. The magnitude of the task God called his own to accomplish assumes his further grace, by the way. We see that he traveled throughout the city. It was a huge city. Many estimate, estimate Nineveh could have been up to around 70,000 people. How about that for a task? Go evangelize 70,000 people. You know, that's... Or seven, not 70, sorry. Did I say 70? Yeah, that's where you would click, Andrew, and you'd go back and fix. 700,000 people. 70,000, that's not too bad. But it's still big, right? 700,000 people. 700,000 people. Go evangelize 700,000 people. I don't know about you, but that would be a big task. Monumental, right? That would be like walking into Tampa the first time and saying, okay, my job is to share the gospel, share the truth of who God is to this whole city. Enormous, right? How does that happen? The grace of God. The grace of God working. They start talking and it begins to spread. What's spreading? The powerful word of God. The word of God spread through that city. Can you imagine walking into our city and thinking that this city's about to be wiped out very soon? 40 days, walk into the city with that message of impending judgment. How would you expect to be received, by the way, in our city? What would you think? What would happen if all of a sudden we walked through the city saying, Judgment is coming in 40 days. <laughs> Yet the assumption is what? God will be with him. God will take care of him. And God will save. That's, Jonah knew that, remember? Chapter 4, we saw that. Jonah said, yep, I knew you were going to give grace to these people. Jonah knew it. So how does Jonah respond to God's gracious recommissioning? Well, verses 3 and 4 state it. Jonah obediently responded. Jonah is now the obedient prophet. What is that? 
That's called a sign of true repentance in the heart. Obedience flows from what? A repentant heart. Somebody that's bowed before the Lord, surrendered to Him, what do we do? We obey. When He tells us to do something, we do it. By the way, we can get people to obey on the outside, but if there's no repentance, it'll go away as soon as something bad happens. If it's not genuine repentance, that's what we need, beloved. That's what we need in this room. Do you understand? That's what we need in our community, and that's what we need in our country. True repentance. An awareness of who God is. And an awareness of God's grace found in Christ. The obedience is obviously emphasized in the, this passage. Jonah arose. Jonah went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And he cried out and said. So here comes the question. Look at it. Verse 4. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. <coughs> now... At this point, there is somewhat of a little debate. And the debate is this. Is this all he said? Is this all he said? Well, that's what the Bible says that he said. But does that mean that it's the full extent of all that he said? I don't think so, and let me tell you why. I think the Bible tells us why. Okay, so stay with me, okay? The Bible tells us that he said something else other than just that. You know what that is? That's a summary of what he said. Now, how do I know? Well, you'll see in a little bit. I think he did say those words, but it was a summation of what he was saying. Okay? I'll tell you what else he said, and we'll see it as we go along. God hates sin, right? So, obviously, his message was what? To call people to repentance. To call them to what? Turn from their sin. Jonah told them God's impending wrath was before them. And they were on a collision course with the justice of God. And it was Jonah's responsibility to proclaim this great message. But he said more. Look at the response in a, for uh, the people, from the people and the king. Look down a little bit. Verse 8. And, or uh, even before that, it says, they believed in God. Okay, if you look back, they, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Is God mentioned in that phrase? No. So how can they believe in God if a man just walks in and says, 40 days, you're dying. You're destroyed. It's over. If... He didn't say something at least a little bit more. What? God's going to destroy you. At the bare minimum, he said what? Forty days and God's going to destroy you. Because what did they have to believe? Who did they believe in? God. So we see. They believe. But notice also the king. The king's response down in verse 8. And let men call on God. Call on God. God is not just this distant God that can't be heard, but he's a God that can be petitioned. So how would they know that God is a God that can be petitioned? Unless what? Jonah told them God could be a God that could be petitioned. That each man turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. So he calls them to what? Repentance, and he gives a great anthropo anthropology, too. He tells them what man's about. He tells them that they are wicked in their core. Okay? He didn't just tell them, hey, you're going to be destroyed. He tells them what? You're going to be destroyed because of what? Your wickedness. Your violence. You're rebelling against God, and you are going to face a just God. Call on the God that will hear you. And then verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. The God has to be that he proclaimed 
also has to be a God that what? Possibly could what? Relent. He could relent. He could give grace. Oh, this is so good. I want you to get this. This is so cool. So what does Jonah tell him? He tells him, I believe this. You'll see it, and I'm going to show you another passage. And I believe the Spirit shows this in, in Luke chapter 11. You'll see it in a second. I believe Jonah says in the sense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God, is a just God, and you are going to be judged for your sin, your wickedness, your rebellion. How do I know that he takes sin seriously? Because he just had me in the bottom of the ocean. He just had me in the bottom of the ocean because I was a rebellious prophet. He told me to come to you, but I went the other way. How do I know that he said this to them? Why is this part of the message too? Yes, it is. It's part of the message. How do I know? Look over at Luke chapter 11. Now, again, I think there's enough evidence in Jonah chapter 3 alone to tell us that he talked about the grace of God that forgives and restores and will give grace. I think there's enough there. However, Luke 11, under the Holy Spirit's direction, illumines what was already known in Jonah chapter 3, just not quite as clear. It illumines it, makes it clearer. Luke 11, verse 29. <coughs> As the crowds were increasing, Jesus, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. Talking about the Jewish people at that time that are rejecting their Messiah. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. Look, verse 30. For just as Jonah became a sign to what? The Ninevites. So will the Son of Man be of this generation. To this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them. Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Verse 32. Then the men of Nineveh will stand, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. His preaching was not just one little line. It was the word of God, who God is and what God does and what God did in me to get you to hear this word. He brought a repentance in my life, the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? That he was in the, bottle of a, in the belly of a whale. Why was he in the belly of the whale? Because he was being what? Rescued from the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Notice Jesus points out, Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, and they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Oh, beloved, do you see this? This is wonderful. This is glorious. Who is the perfect person to proclaim the gospel to a lost world? Someone who has been rescued from sin himself. Someone who has the message of the gospel in their heart and is ready to proclaim that. Jonah was a sign of what to the Ninevites? It was a sign of judgment, that judgment can be avoided and they can be rescued from sure death if they repent and believe in the Lord. I can just see it. I think I cannot. Um, look, I'm, I'm not going to speak past. I'm just telling you I could see possibly. Jonah comes in. He says, judgment's coming from God. And they say, how do we know you're true? How do we know your message is true? What is your message? Well, here's the message. I was supposed to come to you before, but I went the other way. God brought judgment on me. I was at the bottom of the ocean, and a fish swallowed me up. A big fish swallowed me up and saved me at the point when I repented and trusted in God. 
What a God! He's going to judge you. You're in his crosshairs. Listen to me. That's what they need. That's what the community needed. They needed to know that God was a just God and he was what? A gracious God. A God that will save. I believe Jonah told them what God did to him. By the way, chapter 1 and 2 are what? Just thought on this. This is the word of God. <laughs> this is the word of God. So in other words, if he just told them what happened in chapter 2, he would be what? Chapter 1 and chapter 2, he'd be saying what? The word of God. <laughs> he just told them early before it was written down. It's still the word of God. <laughs> This is really cool how this works out. Do you see it? Hopefully you're as excited as I am. He experienced what? Jonah experienced the wrath of God. The sailors faced the judgment of God for his disbelief. He prophesied of his own being thrown overboard, and what happened? He got thrown overboard. Do you think they were sitting there going on the edge of their seat? Hey, there's this guy, this Jewish guy in our city saying God's going to judge him and he just got out of a belly of a fish. He was just rescued. He was supposed to die because he was going against God. That would spread fast, wouldn't it? A guy in the belly of a fish is here proclaiming that God is going to judge us. But again, what would have to happen? It would have to be included with something very important. And what would that be? The grace of God. Because why? It's actually a crazy message. <laughs> it's a really crazy message, isn't it? Everybody in the room, come on, admit it. Seen anybody in a fish lately for three days? It's almost as crazy as the gospel that says what? God became a man, lived a perfect life, and died on a cross to pay for sin, was placed in the grave for three days, and rose from the dead three days later. And if you repent and believe in that God, and that God alone, all your sins were paid for on the cross when he died. What is that to the world? Foolishness. But it's the power of God for salvation to those who believe. Jonah was God's illustration for the people of Nineveh. The preacher... <laughs> was the illustration. The message was more than God's going to whack you. The message was also, you deserve a whack. You deserve judgment. But God is a gracious God. Call out to him. This is our message, beloved. This is our message. We don't seek to make people good on the outside, do we? We don't go in and say, look, please stop hitting each other. We do that sometimes too. But ultimately, our message is what? You're going to face the judgment of God. You must repent and believe in Jesus. If you repent and believe in Jesus, you will stop hitting people, and you will actually love God and love your neighbor. What does America need? Simple. You ready? The gospel. What does this room need? The gospel. That's what we need. We will not stop hitting our, each other. We will not stop loving or start loving people until what happens? Until the gospel is so big in our lives that to obey him is better than any feeling that might come across our hearts. A 
And yet it's all about, ultimately, the compassion of God. Oh, this passage makes me just want to fall on my knees. I, I've, I've thought about this. Maybe we don't, don't even preach anymore. We should just pray for the next hour. We should beg God for mercy for our country. We should beg God for our community. We are a wicked people and we live, live amongst a, pig, a, a, a people group of wicked people. But don't you see the compassion of God? These wicked, wretched people. And what happens, verse 4? A prophet goes in and warns them. Nineveh was not owned a warning shot, was it? Were they owed it, rather? They weren't owned, they weren't owed this. Nineveh was a rebellious city that ruthlessly treated other human beings. Nineveh was known for its hatred and wickedness. Yet, God warns them. Oh, this is amazing in and of itself, isn't it? I know I say it all the time. Y'all always are asking me, what, how you doing? And I always, almost always I say, better than what? And yes, other people say it. Good. Maybe all of us should say it. Why? Because if we think we're owed better than what we have, then what are we? We're lost in sin. If this isn't good enough that you're actually saved, you're in trouble. God warned them. He warned them. And he also used a wicked prophet to do it. This is a great display of God's compassion and his grace. Oh, the wonder of God in sharing the fire to come. Some might say this. Why should we preach an impending judgment? <laughs> Answer? Because they're going to face that judgment? We've all heard this illustration before, but it is a significant one. If your neighbor's house is burning down and you see them in there and you don't tell them, you are worse than a sinner. You're worse than the most wretched person in the world. You watch somebody die in a fire? Beloved, do you understand that this is our community? This is our country. They're burning up. They're like, as uh, 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 Jonathan Edwards said, they're like what? A spider hanging over the pit of hell. And at any minute... It could break the web. And they could fall into the fire. The most loving thing we can do is proclaim, God is a just God. And without repentance and faith in Him, you will be judged. That is the kindest thing you can say to your neighbor. Do you hear me? I hope this burns in your soul. This is why God often uses us to proclaim his word and even including that he's just and hell is coming. To warn people, to give them compassion, to tell them to call out to God who will listen. And notice what happens. The city repents. <coughs> then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation and said, Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. 
and let men call on God earnestly that each man turn from the, his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hand? Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Boy, there's a message from a king, right? Boy, that one. That's the one we need, right? I'm not speaking at all. I'm not trying to make application to my president. But this is what we need from everybody. From the top down, right? Everybody needs to do this. Every one of us, including the ones in this room, all of us. How did they respond? They repented. They repented. And they will stand in judgment one day against those that rejected the Messiah. That's a that's shocking truth. It's coming from Jonah, from northern tribes of Israel that had the word of God, yet what? They were rebellious. He goes to foreign pagans. And they get it. Look at the characteristics of their repentance. Again, y'all know that belief is the other side of the coin of faith, right? You turn and believe. It's not just stop sinning. It's turn to God, a heart commitment. Turning from who you were committed to first, which is who? Myself. My sin. To God. To trust in Him. That's repentance and faith. They called for a personal vow of sacrifice, a fast. Wait, does this contradict Matthew that we read today? Don't. don't. Does it contradict it? No, it doesn't. Why? Because you've got to remember the audience. <laughs> Who was Jesus talking to? He was talking to Pharisees and people that thought that if they do this, they will earn somehow favor with their God. These people weren't trying to earn favor. They were just showing that they were broken completely over their sinfulness. And it was the leader saying, humble yourself. God's going to judge us. Don't do anything else. Can you imagine if that happened? The president comes on screen and says, we are so wretched. Don't eat. Yeah. Don't eat. Stop eating. Fall on your faces, people. We are wicked. We are killing babies. We are wicked, angry, ugly people. Racist. It's a loaded group of ugly people. Fall on your face. That's what needs to happen. That's what needs to happen. I don't care who the president is. That's what, needs, that's what I hope one day will happen. Put on sackcloth. Put on sackcloth. Who did it, by the way? The king put it on. He took off his robe. <laughs> Do you understand what that is? That's craziness. That is, I am the leader. I am the one that runs this whole thing. I'm taking my robe off, and I'm going to put on the poor man's clothes. And I'm going to put ashes on me because I'm wretched and I deserve the judgment of God and it's coming. Everybody got it. Man, can you imagine that happening? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Just in Tampa. Wouldn't that be amazing? Sat in sackcloth. They sat in ashes. This again was self humiliation. Now that wouldn't work in our culture, would it? Why wouldn't it work in our culture? Because we are all about who? Ourself. Heard somebody say just recently, we are the selfie generation. Truth. Truth. 
obsessed with who? Me. We don't look anything like this. Not even close. Nobody really looks like that. And he proclaims, call out to God. He's the one that has hope. <coughs> Only him. I confess, man. When I read this and I think on this, me personally, I need to grieve over my sin a lot more. How about you? I need to loathe my sin more. I need to fear God more. Anybody in here need to fear God more? Show us your glory. Show us your holiness. Bring us to our knees. Start with me. Do whatever it takes, God. Is that your prayer? Beloved, when you look outside and you see the world crashing down around you, Remember this. The only one you're going to stand before for is yourself. Do you fear God? Begin uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what we need. And the Lord relented. Verse 10, when God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Okay, so everybody in the room, wait, 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 wait. If he said he was going to do something and he didn't do it, did that mean it was... He changed his mind or no, he knew all along. <laughs> he ordained their what? Their repentance. He ordained their turn. How do we know? Because Jonah says it in chapter four, what? I knew you were gonna give grace. <laughs> that you were a compassionate God. Sometimes the flames must be turned up in order for us to see just where we are and where we're headed. Beloved, please listen to me. If you're in this room today and you think, oh, well, I'm fine. I'm a pretty good person. You are hanging over the pit of hell and at any moment you could die. If you think based on your good deeds that you are okay, you are you are in a very, very precarious position because you are far more wretched than anything you can imagine. Do you hear me, beloved? Everybody in the room better be listening to me right now. We are wretched, wicked people who rebel against God and our only hope is God. We need to call out to him. And if you say, well, I've already done that. Did you stop sinning? Then you better not stop repenting. How is it that the people of God know the glory of the cross and yet we continue to sin? We do it because our view of sin is way, way too small. Our view of God is way too small. Beloved, listen to me. 
Jesus Christ is your only hope. <laughs> he came into the world to die for sinners. Turn to him and trust him because there is no way out of his judgment without him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. <coughs> Lord, we want to come to you on behalf of ourselves first and foremost. Lord, this week we all were not perfect. <laughs> we all sinned against you. Every one of us in the room, no matter how small or how great or how large, whoever we are, whatever role we have, we all sinned against you. And God, for this, we are <laughs> broken, sad, grieved, we understand that you are a holy and just God and that you discipline your children. We ask, God, that you will forgive us, each one of us. Forgive me, Father. I beg you, please forgive me for my lack of gratitude, my thinking too much of myself at times. God, please forgive me. Forgive us, God, as a church, for fighting and squabbling, treating each other wrong. God, forgive us. Please forgive us. Start with us, God. Please forgive us. Restore us. God, take us, please. And Father, we call out for our country. Father, we are a murdering, angry, wicked, sexually barbaric, pagan people. We need your help. We need your repentance, God. We need your grace, God. Please, please, God. Save Father, we need you. We pray that your word will penetrate all of our hearts and that we will be like Jonah, a repentant prophet that goes and proclaims you to the world. Help us, Father, to stay focused on our sign the one who died in our place and rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of you, Father. Help us to exalt the Lord Jesus. Please, God, break every single heart in here for you. Bring us to the end of ourself that we will call upon you. We love you, Father. We thank you for the grace that you have given us. We pray for you to save.